And now to our first talk in Hall 1. It's titled, I feel like a criminal and I have to be God at the same time. And it will be about how we as a community, there's, there's lots of talk at this Congress about hacktivism, about hacking, but there's not a lot of introspection about what we want to be as a community and how, how we think about ourselves. And now Leonie Maria Tanzer is going to talk about that. Please welcome her to the stage. Hello, good morning. I'm very thankful for seeing so many people despite the fact yesterday was a very, it's the last day, there was a toilet party as I've heard. Um, so greatly appreciated that you came along. Uh, my name is Leni Maria Tanza. I'm a PhD student in the School of Politics, International Study and Philosophy, a very long and dry name, in, Queen, in the Queen's University of Belfast. Um, and today, as the introduction already said, I'd like to give you a small insight into uh, my interdisciplinary research project, um, which is looking at security issues around like hacking and hacktivism, but like more around the issue of how different actors perceive hacking and hacktivism. So I'm looking at the policy level of the European Union, but also, for instance, at uh, the cybersecurity sector, whatever that means, um, and like people who call themselves hackers and hacktivists and what they think. Uh, how they are portrayed and uh, currently perceived. And I'd like, and with the very controversial title, I feel like a criminal and I have to be God at the same time. It's not that I think I am, but like it was a quote by one of my participants. I'd like to give you a rough overview in this next 45 minutes on um, what I found in the course of my study. Um, and before everybody freaks out and says, oh my God, it's a social scientist doing research on this community, um, I do, would like to give a brief kind of disclaimer. I'm aware I'm not like, doing anything like cyber, uh, CSI cyber crime related. I'm not like basically trying uh, to uh, bring people to jail or uh, do kind of armchair psychology or in imitate like this kind of, well, known um, series. And also really important, I'm not funded by the GCHQ because you know I'm from Belfast and everybody assumes that. And it was a question I got quite frequently um, when conducting this study. And it's therefore that I would like to make clear straight away before I start where I'm standing, how I was funded, so that is that nobody can accuse me of any kind of bias. Um, I was hesitant to include it, but I think it's important to make clear where how research is basically currently funded. So what happened to me, I'm funded by the Department of Employment and Learning, which is a government institution in Northern Ireland. They cover my tuition fees because the UK just feels like education shouldn't be free. Um, and the School of Politics of International Studies and Philosophy, they give me 5,000 quid a year, which is not enough. That's the reason why I have a part-time job as a tutor and teaching assistant. And I get like additional funding here and there, um, uh, like the Larmer University Scholarship St. Thunder. It's not that I want to bore you to death with that information. I just want to emphasize one thing. None of these people, none of these organizations had any influence with what I did, had n not like, made clear um, that they had like, uh, a certain kind of interest of finding this. They simply gave me the money on the basis of my funding application. That was it. So I hope I eliminated any doubt at this stage. And I, was, I really felt like I want to get this off my chest because it was a question I got like over the course of this year multiple times. And on that basis, I'd like to make further clear misconception of what I'm interested in doing. I'm working on currently in a field called critical security studies. And uh, what uh, that area is basically doing is like it examines not like what old school security scholars would have done, like, oh, the Cold War is over and what are we doing with the world? It's more about what is the effect of security politics that we are uh, what we are currently having. Um, so um, the, uh, I'm interested in analyzing the consequences and effects of the insecurization of hacking and hacktivism and, and understanding of the practice and identity of hackers and hacktivists. And really important, what I mean with that when I talk about consequences and effects is basically um, how they uh, are portrayed and what they, how they are resisting this kind of portrayal. And really important is for me um, through their eyes by giving them a voice. Um, because I feel like a lot of the literature is basically talking about hackers and hacktivists, but they never really approach them and ask them, what do you think? And that is what I'm keen on doing and hopefully been able to transport here in the course of the next hour. Um, so the overview of what I'm going to talk about is I give a brief definition of hacking and hacktivism so I can offend people with my definition and you can scrutinize what I'm saying afterward in the Q&A. Um, I talk about insecurization. It's a theoretical concept. I assume not a lot of people have heard about it, so I think it's important to talk about what I mean with this. I'm talking about my method, how I gathered the data, how I analyzed it, 
the really important bit about my results. And then like the question of, so what? Why is the social scientist doing this research? Why is it worth funding it? Or why is it even relevant? And last but not least, question answer session, where I hope uh, I'm able to answer questions which remain uh, in the course of this talk. So hackers, um, it's a very ambiguous term, hacktivist as well. Um, you know, you have certain kind of assumption around it. My mom thinks about hackers, something else like you guys think about hackers. And there's also difference around countries and like kind of like uh, context around it. But what I, at least in my thesis, think about like hackers and hacktivists, it relates to computer hacking, at least for my thesis, and comprises activities ranging from unauthorized access, on like manipulating technology for unorthodox means up till the, the production of free software. But it's really important, what I think about hacking is, it, is a technique. So you may use it for like malicious reasons, but you don't need to. And I think that is one aspect a lot of people blind out, and I guess a lot of you think as well. The hacktivism part is a bit more tricky, because that is a word where a lot of people feel offended by. I think it's like useless, it's a buzzword the media uses, but I think it's a really interesting aspect to take into account and I'm merging both concepts because when we talk about hackers and hacktivists at this moment of time, they are both somehow tied in with a certain kind of perception around them, how they look like, how they, what they do, so therefore I merged them for this specific study together despite the fact I acknowledge there might be differences. So hacktivism for me is a form of political activism. Um, performed through hacking techniques. And it's really important that there's something around values and ideology, and that makes it distinct for me to hacking. Because you can hack your washing machine because you want to make coffee with it, but you can hack also the washing machine to set a current perhaps a political statement to, let's say, Siemens. Um, and the really important bit, what I also think a lot of people forget, is like their activities stretch from illegal to legal, so you can do it both ways, constructive and deconstructive. And what I mean with that is the idea of like builders and breakers. And if you're interested in that, there were other talks and papers I've published where, where you can read more around the idea of what I'm thinking around there. And really important is in alliance with your worldviews and against. And what I mean with that is basically uh, as we see currently, um, everybody's really excited when Anonymous does stuff around uh, against ISIS, but when they do something against your own government, you basically perhaps like feel that this is not correct. So hacktivism is like any kind of other political activism. If you are going to an anti-racist demonstration, you are in alliance to that. If you are in the KKK, you certainly wouldn't feel very happy about that demonstration taking place. So this is the important bit about activism. It depends on your worldviews, and that is the same with hacktivism, okay? So the really bit which is troubling or problematic is the terms are controversial. So um, we all have like the idea of like the hacker with the balaclava sitting in front of a desktop, with having the terminal open, and um, the risk misrepresentation like goes in the media, politicians, even like the industry, but also like um, academia. And what is uh, happening is that it's often considered as that kind of a security and threat construction, at least like it, at least in the UK, definitely. Mm. And this is the starting point for my research. This idea of like, we have a certain kind of image in mind about like hackers and hacktivists, and it's like this threat image. And that is where securitization comes in, or more important, insecuritization. And what I mean with that is one does not simply say security. Security is really something um, which is used in political context, achieving a certain kind of purpose, having a certain kind of aim. And in securitization, the theory basically says security issues do not necessarily reflect the objective material circumstances of the world. So um, if you are, for instance, uh, if Angela Merkel steps on the stage and says, we have a terrorist threat, something happens. And the really important bit is security is like uh, co-constitutional, like a co, uh, it, it relates to something insecure. Just like you have the idea of good and bad, it requires the opposite. Security requires an opposite as well. There's something secure and something insecure. And um, in that regard, they are re relative. And if you consider something um, as a security threat, um, what, there must be an opposite to that. And this is an important starting point for my research on um, what happens with when politicians or the cybersecurity sector talks about hacking, what happens with those being the, you know, the insecurity level, the hackers and hacktivists. Because they propagate fear and uh, have an effect. So 
my interest is basically to understand or the, for circularization is how and why this process happens and to identify the effects of it. And the effect is what I want to talk about today in this talk. And this is basically what I'm trying to do and hope to achieve in the next like 30 minutes left. So coming to the method, because that's always a really um, interesting aspect, at least like in academia, it's a qualitative research. And I make straight away the claim, I'm not making any kind of um, claims about the community, whatever that is. Um, it's not generalizable. It was like based on 35 interviews I've conducted in the course of a, a research fellowship. I, uh, I was in Berlin for three months. Um, but uh, the interviews were conducted both face-to-face, -face, but also digitally using voice over IP um, services. And um, I have ethical approval for this uh, um, study, and they were non-occurring interviews, so I've not met those people again necessarily. And like, um, it's really important they were conducted in English and in German, but for the purpose of this talk, all of the uh, quotes have been translated to English by myself. And I know that there's one word which a lot of people will probably get offended by, it's called self-identified, and I know that there are issues around that, and I will touch upon that in the results section, but, I'm, um, but what I mean with that is basically anyone who basically talked to me was made aware in a participant information sheet, which basically gave them um, the, um, the knowledge that they, I'm looking for people who call themselves hackers and activists and they were willing to participate. They were also made clear that like uh, the interviews were audio recorded and I transcribed all the interviews on Tails. They never have been on a Windows computer and will ever be. And if you have more questions around the ethics and data protection issue, please feel free to get in contact with me. And I analyzed the interviews um, with thematic analysis, which is a six step approach. You can read up on it. Um, and basically looking at like kind of themes in the interviews. And the important bit is about P1. So in the course of the next slides, you will see a lot of like P1, P2, P12, whatever. That means participant plus number. So I had coded identifiers to know where this quote comes from, but I did not include any kind of um, for, for more information about them, like their names or the location or anything like that. And really important is also that, um, that there, I also told my participants that they cannot tell me under any circumstances, tell me any kind of incriminating material. So that limits the results as well because they couldn't tell me like, for instance, if they would have done something illegal, which I'm happy they didn't. Um, so that is also important for the further steps in analyzing my results. Okay, and I'm not providing more information about my participants because of the possibility of uh, social risk involved for the people who talk to me. And um, that's simply why I provided you with the numbers and the gender, despite the fact that gender might be, um, there's a slight, like, massive gender um, inequality here, but it was really hard to find females, unfortunately. Okay, so now everybody is completely excited for the results, I hope. Um, the results basically are split into three themes. And the themes, of course, I've identified, um, and I found them because they were uh, on the basis of the method I used, there were different kind of steps I went through, that these were prominent topics coming up in all interviews. And one of them is called identity. And what I mean with that theme is basically the misrepresentation of hackers and hacktivists leads to their differentiation. And uh, I will go into depth around like all of them, but that's just like a short overview of what you can expect over the next like 15, I don't know how many minutes left. The insecurity topic or theme um, is basically the threat to privacy and security for the community leads to their investment in more security. It's like a vicious circle. And the last bit is called system. And what I mean with that is the mistrust in authorities and hierarchies, like in the current political system, leads them to conduct activism and potentially also hacktivism. Okay, a really important point is also there's two different dynamics involved in all those themes. And one, I termed an external and an internal, it's not the most sexy like, definition I could find. But what I mean is with external, what participants think is happening, so they were often saying, you know, society thinks this and that, so what they think is going on, and the internal dynamic is this resistance. So what are they doing against that? Um, and uh, I will talk about both processes for each of the themes, okay. Um, 
So coming to the first theme called identity, which I personally think is really fascinating and one of my favorite uh, themes. And the external aspect is um, to make you, uh, again, like think of it, the first identity theme is about the misrepresentation leads to differentiation. And in the external aspect is basically that due to the process which is happening, they feel pushed out of, sort of, of a sphere of legitimacy, my participants. And one of the first themes or issues which comes up in the interviews quite frequently is the other. So participants talked a lot about like, the aspect that they are considered as like, this w associated with that negative connotation of like, you know, the hackers are the criminals, we are, the, we are somehow uh, put in a categorization, as a participant said, participant free, a categorization that is lump-sided, broad, and where a lot of people would fit in. So it's like a lot of the participants spoke about like it's so, you know, it's so skewed towards one perspective that we have like no possibility to um, be considered anything else. And there's also a duality of perception. That is where the quote that I used for the talk um, of uh, this presentation comes from. I feel like a criminal and I have to be God at the same time. So they are basically often both like heroes, like, you know, my mom thinks they can do anything when they touch her computer, but they can also be, they are also this negative aspect of like the, the criminal, the terrorist whatsoever. And I think it's really interesting. I, I don't know if you've seen that Facebook meme about the Schrodinger's immigrant, and it's the same kind of the Schrodinger's hacker. You're both like heroes and like this incredible magicians, but at the same time, you're the weirdos who you know, break every computer. And that is an interesting dynamic. And uh, Sauter talks about like that in regards to her, in her book about DDoS action, how anonymous is often portrayed as like that folk devil, that boogeyman we're using um, to basically uh, emphasize their, 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 their otherness. And um, that does not necessarily correspond to what my participants perce perceive them. The other thing, and I used a quote to basically um, exemplify this, it's from the Daily Mail, which is a very high quality newspaper in the UK, um, is uh, the stereotypical portrayal, portrayal. And that goes along with an equation. And so there's, a, there's the idea of like, they are the cultural outsiders. They are the terrorists, the weirdos, the sociopaths. And it's really interesting because if you read the book on Greenwald, he spoke about the same thing dynamic with uh, Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, Assange, where basically their personal life got, and their political actions got entangled with like their mental health or um, they were Nazis, delusional, anything like that. And the same thing basically my participants emphasized that the hackers, you know, as it says, a baby face, they're young, they have black hoodies, sit in the cellar, are weirdos. And I mean, like, if you read the news and especially quality newspapers like that, you will find those stereotypes and this is one of the best examples I can think of. So this personality disorder is often there and they feel like they, they, a lot of participants were speaking out against this equation of being the terrorists, of being the weirdos. Another aspect which is happening according to them is scapegoating. And I call that instrumentalization. It's the purposeful attempt to pull them towards that, and that's a quote, the stupid word they use, cyber, cyber warfare, cyber warrior, all this nonsense. And funny enough, the CSFI, which is like an American military organization company um, related to the state, uses you know, that cyber word as well support the warfighter in cyberspace. And I, I, I know that the word here is very controversial. Um, there's cool stickers around, lying around here about the whole word cyber. But it's basically hackers, cyber, all those words are jumped into and brought into the context to basically get funding, um, make people think of like, uh, oh, I need to buy a new McAfee product or whatsoever. And that is another aspect participants spoke about. The scapegoating, like the hacker word is used and dropped to basically make, uh, and cybersecurity would love hacktivists, for instance, because they're going to help them sell all kinds of crap. So it's basically a word used to get money rolling. And uh, another example is here this, on CNBC, there was an article, making money in the war against hackers. So um, that is another dynamic which, think, which participants emphasize is taking place. Now, what is basically then the resistance? How do they counteract this process? And that is super fascinating for me. One aspect is the broadening of the term. So um, I bet if I ask everyone in here what hacking or hacktivism is, I will not get a coherent answer from anyone. And that was the same I've identified with the participants. Um, so all of them were emphasizing basically it's a broad concept. We talk about innovating, about like providing shortcuts up until to finding the truth. Um, so it's like some people consider it as an art of understanding the world. 
people call hacktivism online rebellion. I could give you tons of quotes around the issue, but what it means basically is it's very diverse and it's completely contrary to what the media portrays, what the politicians portray, what my mom thinks of hackers. It's like two different things basically. And the other thing is being a hacker and hacktivist is, is a mindset and it's an attitude. And I think that is really interesting to basically think about like who is working in the industry and are all people working in the industry hackers? And there seems to be not the case that these like participants emphasized that some of them, you know, you can study computer science, science, but you don't need to be a hacker. There's a difference here. There's a different kind of mindset. And that is like encompassed to the broadening of the term, which goes against the narrowing and the lump sided aspect the, 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 the other side is basically doing. The other thing is they distinguish themselves. So often my participants highlighted a diversity. So they said about legal, illegal, white, black, positive, negative, all of that. And so basically they emphasize not every hacker is a black hat. And uh, what is really important here is also that there's legal ways of being a hacker. And I mean, like everyone here knows that, but like I still want to emphasize this is a research done for a broader academic audience, which does not know that. So, um, so they talk, for instance, about like, you know, I mean, what we cause might be bit damage, but that might be physical damage you can do when you bomb like, a t not that anyone would do that, but like, um, I just give an equivalent here. So they oppose also certain kind of hacks, which they're often accused of. So for instance, against the media or private individual or critical infrastructures, all words politicians would use to basically construct a picture of like the hackers, which is a specific kind of idea are doing. So they're distinguishing themselves. Really important is also they reclaim and clean the term. And I think that is really interesting in regards to, for instance, how they distinguish between, for instance, hacking, cracking, despite the fact I acknowledge that not everybody loves that term. Um, and also they're focusing on like official organization. I mean, we're here at the CCC, it's acknowledged uh, organization, the EFF, La Quatre du de Net, all of that. So there, there's ways of like keeping it clean by, by being in an organization which uses that term. And basically, therefore, we are reclaiming the word. And there was a quote, and there was multiple quotes where people said, for example, the CCC managed to make it a positively connotated term, which is not the case in many other countries. And I can say that this is certainly the case in the UK. Um, and uh, also people were emphasizing hackers have a good reputation in Germany, which goes along with the idea that, you know, CC is one of the oldest and largest hacker communities in the world. Um, and what comes out here is like the idea of uh, self-identity. And what, that is really fascinating because there seems in my participants being a flexible identity around like, um, despite the fact everybody agreed to talk to me, knowing that I look for people who call themselves hackers and activists, Every, no, nearly every time people said, well, you know, I not, would not run around calling myself a hacker. Um, or, but despite the fact they acknowledge I'm falling into this category. So people would say, I never introduced this, myself like this. And there's one aspect, for instance, I would not define myself as a hacker when I'm, for instance, talking to them and they meant politicians, because, you know, it has negative connotations to it. Um, that is really an important aspect because there seems to be something going on between security researchers versus hackers. And the term is used here as well, but read the news magazines. When are they referring to hackers and when are they referring to security researchers? Doing the same thing, but like suddenly it might swap um, in the media. And so for instance, one participant said, I've been asked by an immigration officer once if I was a hacker, and that was kind of funny. I told him I was computer security researcher. I'm, I'm not sure what exactly he meant by hacker. Uh, and this has happened to all, uh, other friends. And their other person says, for instance, there were some situations where I'm a hacktivist or other times when I'm a security uh, guy. And that is interesting. I'm, I acknowledge um, uh, social identity theory, it's a psychological theory, it's basically saying, you know, you can have shifting identities. For instance, I could say, for instance, you're the audience, I'm, whoops, you're the audience, I'm the speaker, but I could make another identity salient. I could say, I'm a female, so all of the other females in this room might identify with that, and I create a different kind of category. I could say, I'm an academic, and suddenly I create all other identities in the room where you feel aligned to. And the same thing seems to happen here, but what is really interesting is that the security researcher seems to be kind of a life belt you fall back to if you want to introduce yourself in a different kind of term. And I think that is really interesting to think about. 
Um, so in that regard, it's like a Möbius ribbon. Um, why am I using this idea? Because you know the flexible uh, idea of identity. People always consider your identity as being like a coin. You're either one side, you're black hat, or you're white hat. But in fact, you're like a hacker and a security researcher. You have day jobs. Like I don't know what you're doing when you leave today. Tomorrow you might be a pen tester, be like a software engineer, anything like that. But you can have different shifting identities, and there's a really important aspect research has have to acknowledge that that is not just like one thing um, and uh, uh, that kind of stable. And really important is here that there's two dynamics of which is a consequence of like the hacker idea being portrayed as that negative. On the one side, you can't call yourself a hacker because it has negative connotations. And that was seen by people being basically saying, oh, I would never talk to a politician using that term. But the other thing is meritocracy. Everyone here, it's like, I give you an example. You, I would, you know, people would never call themselves experts. You would be like, absolutely, if that was a, a, a word someone used, it would be presumptuous to call yourself a hacker. And that's the same thing. There must be something, everybody acknowledged we are on a hacker conference, but not, not a lot of people would run around saying, I'm a hacker. You feel a line and a, associated with the identity, but you're not like fully in it. And there's a similar equivalent, like an LGBT member in Russia currently would not run around necessarily saying, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm gay, but they feel associated with LGBT. And that is like that negative connotation aspect. The meritocracy aspect is more related to that expert aspect that, you know, you can't use that term because, you know, you would be, uh, you, yeah, you'd be considered like an asshole. Um, and so that is like the way they resist by having that like step back word of security research or anything which is currently acknowledged as legitimate. Now, coming to the second theme, insecurity. And what happens here, as I said, the threat to privacy and security leads to an increase of insecurity. It's a vicious circle. And what happens externally is a erosion of rule of law. I don't need to say a lot about that. I mean, all of the talks basically emphasize this. Um, people talked about the rights are getting circumscribed. Internet has been criminalized. But the really important bit is like my participants emphasize that this is a fallacy. Risks are inevitable. People would choose a false sense of security over the necessity of a privacy. And they are basically um, criticizing that the erosion of law is basically you have to choose either security or um, like freedom. And um, that is a really like that is a really important aspect of what's going on um, in the interviews. They also emphasize in the course of this the exaggeration, overestimation of threats we currently see. Everything is hyped up. And I love that quote on like General Alexander goes, Anonymous could take down the power grids. Bullshit. It's complete bullshit. It's so far from anybody's technological capability. And we see that quite often. I love also the quote because I could use bullshit in a context I not need to basically justify myself using it. Um, but like they basically use um, the idea that like you use you, you really instrumentalize scapegoat hacker in a context of like a political speech to make the average citizen or person be thinking, oh, I need to do this or that, and we need to be scared of them. Um, but the really important bit is like um, that um, people think we need to look skeptical when the government calls something a security threat and that they have mistaken the security issue because um, this uh, results in a climate of suspicion, both externally by politicians in, uh, and others, but also within that community. Um, people uh, said a lot about like um, that they have like problems getting stopped at airports, are anxious when people ring the doorbell, or face personal repercussions such as like freedom of travel. And um, that, that is really interesting that the participants basically feel that form of losing control over their own safety, privacy, and independence, which is fascinating by a community which is so focused on like being in charge of their own like devices, their technology, etc. So um, what ha happens therefore as a resistance to these processes is um, the investment in more security. And that is a really, really insightful way of like talking about it. And I think uh, more people need to acknowledge that hacking, hacktivism, is a form of an ecosystem. Um, people, or participants basically said, they are the security in the system. So while pe politicians talk about hackers as this negative threat, as the threatening aspect, participants say, for instance, hackers would find a security loophole, the manufacturer is then forced to close the security loophole, whereupon other hackers, or the same hackers, come along and would find new security loopholes. It's a vicious circuit, it's an ongoing process of improvement and awareness raising, and a participant said the equivalent would be product testing. Nobody would you know, think of like uh, using a car where the belt hasn't been tested, um, but like hacking, that is considered as like that 
problem where you can't try to find a security loophole because, you know, um, we would rather not know. And then it, the really important part comes here, the irresponsibility aspect about it. So my participants emphasized it's not my responsibility. I'm not liable for, you know, the loopholes. I'm not increasing the risk. The risk is already inevitable. Software has already or hardware has already been produced, which has a flaw. And so, for instance, what this one said, not to hack is the biggest security risk of all because someone will exploit the thing. So, and I think that is an important aspect to, to think about because if I look at data from politicians, they are thinking rather not tell the security ex uh, loophole exists, whereas they basically emphasize, no, it already is there. We need to basically make it uh, uh, seen by everyone. And I thought that was a way, new way of thinking of security and insecurity and, and the contacts. Um, the other aspect is then this personal security they are emphasizing. And I mean, we all use Signal, Tor, whatsoever. So this investment in individual security of using encryption or this software to disguise one's personal identity stands in huge contrast to what the state is currently trying to do. So I, 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 used, I, I did interviews with people working in the cybersecurity sector, like the management, and they often said like centralization, um, they rather have everything like basically in their own hands sell that product to a customer and then like make sure that everything is safe but the customer has nothing to do. And the other way happens here, like they are completely saying, I want to take security in my own hand. So um, there, there is like that contradicts like the security perception we see with like other actors and that means just that we can't really find a way of like talking to each other. Um, and I personally want to ask like in that regard if it's not somehow then also helping the personal security or the public security that hackers and hacktivists are so emphasizing this personal security for themselves because as, we, as I just said, we have tools like Tor, Signal, etc. Okay, coming to the last theme, um, which is really merging from that technological side I just emphasized that um, they're not just tech developing technological alternatives my participants, but they also engage in political, the political system more closely. So system here just doesn't refer just to political system, but technological system as well. And so the mistrust in authorities and hierarchies, that is the argument in this, uh, in this theme, is basically leading to certain kind of activist forms, to resistance form. Um, and that applies so, uh, technically and so politically. So externally what happens is they are not perceived as like the same kind of equivalent to other actors. And that is obvious because um, we see, we all know the wonderful term public-private partnership, but that misses the third actors according to my participants and that is the civil society which my participants consider hackers to be part of and hackers to be part of. So what they criticize is in the political sphere is the lack, so what happens is the lack of ability to get heard because governments are out of touch with the definition of a hacker and what it would be. So, a quote, a participant said, that's all just old men with ballot points, or um, they are like uh, other people said, for instance, they're like my parents, they happily get a tablet and learn how to use Google, but that's it. So, um, the lack of knowledge of politicians is also criticized, um, and that also makes it hard for them to get involved in those two dynamics. And that's the reason why politicians often use the industry to get like help in like writing um, policy statements, as we all know, and, but the problem is the industry is focusing also on the wrong kind of experts, according to my participants. They talk about business blabblers, and I guess I, everybody here in this room knows who they are talking about. They're talking about the management who are like perhaps like have studied computer science, been in the business for like 50, 30 years, no, 30 years probably, and now they have been like out of touch with the technology uh, for my participants, and they're more interested in like gaining like um, more income rather than like on the technology itself. And it's a huge, a, a quote, huge money-making machine we're producing. And a really big critique is on the revolving door. So um, what I mean with that, or what my participants mean with that, is like this: how these two spheres basically reproduce themselves. You have people going to secret services. Um, and working there, stepping out, going into industry, probably selling the government products and like then um, making money with it and w going back into the uh, political sphere in, in, uh, uh, in, in a certain kind of, uh, yeah, uh, in, the, in, a, in the NSA or GCHQ or whatsoever. So there is that revolving that they are basically two spheres but they're missing the third actor. 
the other thing is what happens is the skepticism. And that relates to power and privileges, both on a technical side, but also on a political side. And I thought that was really insightful, at least for political science like myself. Because like, there's not just a doubt in the network infrastructure. So for instance, people said, um, you know, the uh, internet is very, very vulnerable at every single level and it's screwed over, over already. But there's also that comparison between, you know, you can t attack like a s technical system on the top level, which would get you access to everything. But the same thing would apply to political level. If you, you know, bribe Angela Merkel now, you know, you could achieve higher things as well. And uh, I think that relation between hacking, not just as that technological aspect, but hacking also like a political sphere is important to emphasize because it is taking place. And um, so the focus of decentralization, distribution, heterarchy, that is one aspect which we see like on a technological side, but also to emphasize on what politically should be done. And the best example, of course, is uh, anonymous because the media still struggles to define them and talk about them. The other aspect is hypocrisy. And there's one dynamic about like, interviews emphasize that there's a public private sector applying hacking methods. For instance, Aplex did that with uh, a DDoS action against uh, Harry Bay, but there's also ex other examples like on anonymous servers, et cetera. But this applies a double standard because participants were really frustrated because they, government obviously have security specialists or security researchers who are allowed to do this, they use, are still uh, applicable to the same laws, but they are, uh, but they can They suddenly have the license to hack, so to say, and they really wonder what is the security problem, because like if people say we can't use DDoS attack, is it the activity they criminalize? Is it the actor or is it the intention? And that is not clear. And I think that is a discussion we need to have. And the other aspect is the hypocrisy around, like for instance, exploits, because governments are allowed to have them. They portray zero days. And they don't operate in the legal framework they try the community to basically put in. And so um, for, for my participants, uh, is then the preservation of security, not according to the internet, not assured by intelligence service, but by this community here. So, um, and how do they resist this process? One aspect, and I think that is very interesting, perhaps you, perhaps this is something people know here, but have never been really focused or made aware of, no collaboration. And that is the rejection to work for the state institution, like police or intelligence agencies. And that is, according to my participants, very strong in Germany, um, where you basically would not like work for them or should not work for them. And they are aware that you know, NSA employs, or the GCHQ or the other institution employs hackers and that they have them, but there's a difference. So they distinct here ideologically again between like different kind of people. And there's really an important aspect of internal disciplining, internal policing. And the participant said, if you're working for the FBI in the United States of America because you think the technology they are using is absolutely awesome or because you're technically interested, there's ab that is absolutely legitimate, independently of the purpose. However, if you do the same thing in Germany, then people will kick you out of, and that meant the Cox Communication Congress. You're simply not allowed to think that this is awesome because it's evil. So what this person basically emphasized is that there are certain kind of differences, and people spoke about an American hackerdom, a European hackerdom. There's different kind of mindsets, and it makes it hard to speak about a hacker community, at least for me as a researcher, and I'm still struggling with how to phrase around that. But there seems to be that dynamic of like how to keep it clean again here in this aspect. And there are two last dynamics are one aspect is politicization. So one is that the hacker scene has become politicized over the course of the last years. And we see that very well, like yesterday in Frank's talk was like how the hacker community is involved in politics and looks at social and political questions. And they also think of themselves, my participants, as a, a counterpart to the industry, which is so influenced on like more the money-making machine rather than like the actual social and political output. And so people are involved in advocacy. I mean, you've seen the noisy square like with EFF, etc. So to support digital rights online. And the other aspect is hacktivism, and that is an interesting one. And uh, I haven't thought of that before I started this research like that. So there seems to be a two-way dynamic. And one aspect, the broader hacker community who has over the course of the last years, decades, become politicized. But according to my participants, there's a new kind of a younger generation online which they call hacktivists. Or I mean, the term as acknowledged is very controversial. But what they mean is um, that one, you can have a hacker becoming politicized. Two, there's a new dimension of like people coming in 
calling themselves hacktivists. And three is also that I would probably consider myself as both, yet I'm coming initially more from the traditional hacking scene. So, so the, the third aspect is then basically that people have focused, have become like hacker and hacktivists at the same time. Um, and interesting about the younger generation aspect is then that would explain why people, a lot of like old school hackers, whatever you mean with that, but at least my participants um, would think like why they are not that open to that term because it's like different suddenly. And it's also a way to counterbalance the devaluation of traditional protest form that is currently taking place because you can do a demonstration as a lot of you know and then you can still basically um, not get anything done. So hacktivism might be that like option out of that process. So that was a lot of information to take in and to break it down quickly. So we talked about identity insecurity system and there's different kind of dynamic internally and externally. So externally is what is happening. So they're the criminological order, the equated with cultural outsiders and scapegoated. And therefore internally what happens is they're broadening the term, they distinguish themselves, they reclaim and clean the term and they also have that flexible identity of like being both a security researcher, a hacker, or whatever you call them as well. The other aspect is the other insecurity, so the erosion of law, feeling sense of security, exaggeration, etc. And how they counteract that is by basically emphasizing we are an ecosystem, we belong all together. There's a false sense of a security, we rather choose like basically security over freedom, um, and uh, they invest in their own privacy and security technology. And last but not least, system, they're basically emphasizing that there's a missing third actor which are they, and like skepticism of societal and technology system and hypocrisy. And they resist by basically no collaboration with the police, internal disciplining and politicization and hacktivism potentially. Okay, now you might say, well, interesting, you are able to talk for an hour, but what do we do for that? Or what do we take for it? On one side, what I hope with this research in, or my PhD in general is to uncover the practices that are currently taking place in that wonderful cybersecurity sector, whatever that is. So I'm interested to make sense of that bullshit bingo that is often being taking place and to identify what hacking and hacktivism means to different actors and how that basically contradicts or correlates. And that's basically where I'm standing with this research and why I did it with those three actors. And thus, what I'm interested to do is basically is a sociology of group of people that for, so far have predominantly been only talked about as just make a quick Google search, often takes place, the hackers, but nobody talks about who they are and, and has approached them. And I think one aspect I do want to personally say, I'm aware of Fefe's blog about like, you shouldn't talk to social scientists and I'm completely aware that there's a lot of like scumbags out there who probably do research for malicious purpose. But I do think it's interesting for a community that is so focused on like, you know, show me your data, show me your code, show me your stats. You, ha you basically lose out of basically not talking to social scientists by getting, basically getting screwed over by all the shitload of publications who basically just say those hackers. Um, so I got that off my chest as well. Um, the other thing is like, I want to do a study and a critique on what the insecurization of this current system does to groups of people. And this is not just hackers. It does, takes place with immigrants, with any kind of group which is often marginalized. I want to counterbalance the dominant research FOTSI. And uh, this was basically mentioned yesterday by uh, people saying, or f two days ago about counter storytelling. And I think that is an important way of approaching this research as well. I want to dem 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 demystify the position of hackers and hacktivists, perhaps, you know, there's a way of reclaiming the word, making it not that malicious again. And last but not least, also deglorifying it, like not making it that criminal activity my mom thinks I'm currently always doing research on. And last but not least, an ability to develop code and hacking is one possible and valuable form of involvement of people in the political and social discourse. And I hope that this research contributes to that. And I'm looking forward to your questions and answer sessions. And I'm really, like, my attempt was basically to talk about to not just do the research, but also come here and basically show what I have found. And I'm happy for any kind of feedback criticism you might have. And uh, I'm, thank you for basically listening. Thanks for the great talk. We now have about 15 minutes for Q&A. So please, as always, line up the microphones here. And also, of course, if you're out there in cyberspace, you can go on the ISC, you can go on Twitter to ask questions. We have a cyber real-world interface here. 
just for you. And we'll actually start with the internet. Yeah, the internet has got one question so far. What are your views about responsible disclosure agreements in regards to hackers and criminal activity, especially when the RDA also includes monetary rewards? Um, so the question is basically how, what I think my opinion is on them doing that. Okay. Um, I guess uh, that, that is an option. Um, my interest was not like to identify what is correct or wrong. My interest was more in like what do hackers think that's currently happening and what, how they perceive themselves. Um, disclosure was an issue more in whistleblowing terms. Um, the money aspect was not coming into play, but what people said is that they were sick of like, re like releasing bugs and letting people know and then nobody doing anything upon that. So um, perhaps the money reward is helpful. I, have n I, I don't know if that is answering that question, but that was what was in the data, basically. Microphone number one, please. Thank you for your talk. Uh, in one of your first slides, you contrasted the term constructive not with destructive but with deconstructive. Mm. Was that intentional and is there a distinction? Um, I haven't thought of that. Um, I, I just felt like deconstructive. So the constructive is also a term like in, in social science is used to basically talk about socially constructive aspect. But um, uh, I, I didn't do it on purpose. I just meant like basically that builder breaker distinction that is often used and um, Perhaps it's a better way to phrase it, but I think I will think about that if I, if I should have used a different term. Thanks. <laughs> Number two, please. In your talk, you um, in your methodology, but also in the answers of uh, of your participants, you seem to convolute the political statements that are made by politicians and the, the views of individual government employees held internally. And for someone who is not within government, I can imagine that's difficult to d distinguish. But my experience is that there's actually quite a lot of disparity between the two. Is there any incentive that you detected or that you feel within yourself to search for such disparities? Well, the thing is, like, this is not a study on the political discourse. All I was referring to is what my participants talked is happening. Um, I did see that, like, in a previous study on the political discourse, and I acknowledged that you can work in an organization because you just have to do a da daily work job where you get paid for, but don't agree with the organization. And the same thing is, like, happening, and that was the aspect of the security researcher. People who perhaps think of themselves as hackers or belonging to that community can work on a day-to-day -day job in certain kind of industries they completely hate. You know, they can be in a company which uses cyber all the time. Um, but uh, the, 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 the important aspect is basically um, that they still, you can still disagree with that, but uh, make a criticism around the issue of like what goes on, and that is what happened here, but I didn't make a statement about the politicians or the political discourse or the people working in governments in itself. It was more about the hacker, hacktivist side. And they can potentially work in governments, but what seemed more to happen is that they would refuse to do that. I don't know if that is answering the question. No, not exactly. Because what I'm, I'm, I'm Dutch, and from uh, in the Netherlands, my experience is that there's actually a lot of interfacing with the government from the oh. uh, hacker community. Yes. Not so much having them work inside the yes. government. Yeah. And that's an entirely different interface to the government than via the political discourse. Oh yeah. No, you're absolutely right. That takes place. I mean, the CCC is the best example. You can, you know, be consulted for certain kind of policies if you want to have like the electoral computer in your in your constituency or not. Definitely. No, that, that takes place, and the people said that that was the, the issue around the third actor being missing. And they do try to engage with that, and that was the slide on politicization, that they are involved in activism and advocacy, um, but there's still a suspicion, and that is completely legitimate. I hope that is now answering that. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Number one, please. Hi, thank you for your talk. I was wondering if you uh, could contrast or, or compare uh, the uh, hacktivism uh, with other kinds of activism that we've been uh, seeing because uh, in, in a sense, of course, hacktivists are act uh, some form of activists, but you also mentioned, for instance, uh, the LGBT community uh, and uh, in a sense, uh, I, I feel like, okay, hackers seem like experts on this uh, technical field and see themselves uh, like, um, and that's something similar, like LGBT people uh, know a lot about their experiences with discrimination on, on that field. Uh, Black Lives Matter 
center activists actually know about racism compared to some, I don't know, Republican politicians. So uh, uh, in, in a sense, uh, this, uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you've uh, also maybe done previous research on, on uh, other kinds of activism or if you know of that research and could uh, compare it a bit. Uh, what, what is the same? What are the differences? Yeah. So the thing is, the, pro or the, the tricky part about the term and the concept of hacktivism is where do you differentiate between normal activism, what we consider, and hacktivism? Now, my answer to that is hacktivism, you, knows, you need to do something with technology which has a form of hack. So you can't just tweet that, or you can't just use a blog, or it needs to be a bit more like technically involvement there. And now we can talk about DDoS action being that or not, but it has been termed as such, and it is some form of like using technology like out of a place and context it was not meant to be. And the difference I see with hacking and normal activism is simply the tools you use. It's still achieving the same kind of p sending a political message. And some people use like direct action in an offline uh, um, way, and other people use perhaps hacktiv hacktivism. So the LGBT community could use hacktivism as a technique to do something. So that is my difference here. You don't need to be a hacker to be a hacktivist. And that is also the last slide about like this new kind of form of activism coming into play. Um, so perhaps we will see more of that in the future, I have no clue, and perhaps the term will become more s concrete, because at this moment of time it's just like a word you throw around, just like I did in this sense, because it is obviously that some people use that term for themselves, and who might be in this room at this moment of time or wherever, um, but they still perhaps either associated, you can associate yourself with the hacker community as a hacktivist, but you can be an um, LGBT or a feminist using that tool as well. So that's kind of uh, a funny way of considering that. It's just a technique in that regard for me. I hope that answers that. Thank you. Yeah. And now for cyberspace. Do you have a question? Yes, cyberspace has a question. Uh, you're at a hacker conference and you're trying to hack public perception. Would you self-identify as a hacker now? Um, I got that question uh, at one stage that like perhaps you I'm you can hack like, I personally think you can hack gender, you can hack like social class, you can do that. Um, probably in the course of my research people would call me then like being biased if I would run around calling myself a hacker and as I said the whole meritocracy aspect you can be quite like an asshole if you say oh I'm a hacker. Um, so I'm, I would rather abstain, I would call myself rather a social scientist having observed that than uh, using that term to step on someone's toe and say, uh, running around with that term. Any more questions? This is your last chance. The internet again. Yeah, the internet is full of questions. <laughs> In your research, were there any particular... <laughs> Thanks. In your research, were there any participants that sought out support or help because of issues of depression or lack of identity? So I'm, I'm a bit reluctant. I don't know if I should answer that or not, because you know, like then I, I could get more questions around who are they, what are they doing. Um, I rather abstain giving that information. More internet. Yes, I'm not coming up with these. I'm just forwarding them. <laughs> Did you see a cultural origin of the hacker? Um, not, I could come back and ask what is cultural origin, um, but that would be a very social science way of like debating. Um, I, I don't know, like, uh, so the question I get a lot, so what is the stereotypical hacker? But then I would end up doing the same thing like the whole research does, like, I, I don't know, I think the community is very diverse, it would be far too easy to just think you all sit down at home in front of a computer with the terminal open in a balaclava, I don't know if you do, um, I have no proof of that. Um, but. Um, I don't know, cultural origin. So what I think is really interesting, what I saw in the interviews was that aspect, that mindset, that attitude. That seems to be something which develops. You, 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 you know, that is what I mean. You can find a computer scientist, you know, having studied programming, doing his or her day-to-day -day job, you know, but then there's a different kind of attitude. Um, and where this comes from, I have no clue. That would be interesting, but I'm sure like there would be no openness to your statistical analysis on the community here. So um, it, it will remain open and I couldn't answer that question sufficiently. I just say no to everything, I'm very sorry. More internet? 
You have just a quick follow-up to the depression issue. Um, the, the question wasn't who had the issue, but just if it happened and how it was dealt with. So the, if my participants had it, no. Oh, yeah, I, I, that was not a question I would ask, so I wouldn't know and I wouldn't like to apply, imply that. Microphone number one, please. Hi, thanks for your talk. So um, you mentioned the um, sociology community that was I mean, doing research on hacking. Perhaps, and, yeah. Yeah, and you refer to them as kind of the others also in a way. So um, just a question, so how big is that research community? How, how many people are you talking about? And what kind of um, publications um, um, do, they, do these other sociologists yeah. do? So what could be um, po possible titles of their publications? What do they learn? There you go, there was the stepping stone. Uh, not the stepping stone, the one where I stumbled across. Um, so when I said sociology, so I said I'm in a field called critical security studies. Sociology, anthropology does a really good, perhaps I did them injustice by saying sociology. Um, I meant social sciences in general. Um, so there's a lot of people who do incredibly good work like and, and try to be and try to talk to people and represent them. But I'm more referring to that aspect. The field I'm currently in is that security research in IR, international relations, political science, who more tend to talk about cybersecurity and then using hackers as like an example of why we should invest more money, get more funding into the universities, blah, blah, blah. And that, that is the field. And um, how many there are, I mean, like, um, I can only talk about like the, the, the literature review I've done for my PhD thesis on the field of insecretization. And there are a few people who, who are critical, like there's a new publication in 2005 on anonymous and the insecretization of anonymous in international relations, and that's quite good. But what happened again is like, it was researchers sitting down, having a thought and writing up a paper, but I was more interested in basically stepping back and giving the floor to people saying their own things. And that, I think, is not happening. I, I don't know of that many, like, Gabriella Coleman does that. I mean, she has, like, uh, in her book, um, given a lot of quotes of, like, people in IRC, et cetera. Um, so it happens, and I think sociology, anthropology is a field where it goes on quite well. But I think, like, for instance, these old school, uh, old school IR scholars who perhaps sit in, like, prestigious universities in the US and think of, like, more of cyber security are more using hackers as a way of, like, justifying new, th uh, you know, more funding or intrusion in security. So how much publications we're talking about, I would not know. Um, I have no list of that. But um, we can, I can show you my, my, my list of papers I admire and list of papers, which is far higher, where I feel like they, they're going in the wrong direction. Thank you. And we're out of time. Please, once again, thank Leonie.